13, incredible, incredible passage. It's going to be in like just a few verses, if you could believe that. Um, we started to talk about our doctrine as a church, what we believe in, and these are the fundamentals uh, as a church. So we started off by um, our doctrinal belief in the Bible. Um, we believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and then we even kind of talked about being empowered with the Holy Spirit, what that means for us. That's where we've been, and so got just a couple of more of these. Um, th these for us, these are the foundational truths that we adhere to as uh, a church, and this has been the orthodox of the church. It's, this isn't anything new that I'm presenting to you. Uh, this is what church for thousands of years has done. And so Amen. I want to talk about that, the church. I want to talk about you, talk about me, and what God has called us into, and, uh, uh, which is two things, two things. I've got two things for you. That's all. Sorry, sorry I'm going to be a lot shorter than last week. I know some of you were like looking at your watches. <laughs> two things, right, about the church, um, that what it looks like, and what the church accomplishes. Those are two easy things, what the church looks like and what the church accomplishes. Um, let me lay this out before you, and you can take it however you want to. Um, I preach this message, and I do this with confidence in what God has for the local church because I believe in the local church. And I'll side note it with, however, I have every reason... Um, because of experiences within the church to say I don't want anything to do with the church okay now that's that's my past okay I have plenty of reasons to say they're just messy and they're they keep giving themselves self-inflicted wounds I've been a part of that and I've seen that where I could easily have just said en enough of this I don't want nothing to do with this okay so I have that under my belt and I know some of y'all probably got that, that same idea, too. Like, some of you, this is actually a huge thing that you're here being a part of a church because some of you probably said that I'll never wa walk into another community church uh, again. So I get it. However, I'm telling you from that perspective that I still believe in the church despite her self-inflicted wounds. I still believe in the church despite what they have probably done to you and what they've done to me. And if you've never been inflicted by the church with a wound, hang out here for a little bit. It may happen. Uh -oh. And the reason why I say that, and I don't say that in, in a, a joking way. I say that because you are sitting beside someone who is imperfect. They are flawed. They will disappoint you. So let's lower the expectation just a little bit, all right? Um, now, that was free 99 for you. That had nothing to do with my sorry. I just feel like sharing that with y'all. So that's the church, okay? I believe in the church. I have given my life to the church. I shouldn't have planted a church, but I did because my trajectory was very, uh, we'll, we'll say narcissistic, because I had my own plan, and it was going to be my way. However, that is not what God wanted. And so I believe in the church, and I'm here standing before you because I love you, and I love the church, okay? And some of the things that I say today, they're kind of like fresh in my thinking, so you could take it for what it is. They probably should have settled in the oven, proverbial oven, for a little while longer, but we'll, we'll just see how it goes, okay? Uh, but some of, these, some of these ideas are just some things that I've been wrestling with, and I'm going to present them to you and try to do this without hyperboles and all of that stuff and jokes and all the stuff that I always give you. Um, let me get to work. Acts chapter 13, all right? <laughs> Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says this, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, Cyrene, Manaean, we're just calling Manny for short, okay? Close friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, the guy now know as Paul. As they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, just set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. I want to answer two questions. What does the church look like? And what does the church accomplish? And in three small verses in the book of Acts, we find an answer to what the church looks like and what the church accomplishes. This is the church that we adhere to in our doctrine. This is led by Jesus. He is the founder of the church, Amen. the general contractor, as I like to call him, of the church. And Jesus said in Matthew 16 that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the church that has been going on for 2,000 years and will continue until Christ's return. And I want to display to us and show us just in these three small verses what the church looks like and what the church accomplishes. This is an interesting pool of people. In fact, if you read this, you might, you might have thought how I've gone, in my mind, looks like a bar joke. Um, black dude, white dude, Jew, walk into a bar. In fact, to uh, make my point a little heavier, um, I want to show you this video. This is actual footage of what it looked like on that day. Um, this is an actual footage of Barnabas, Saul. You get it? You see what I did there? Horse walked into a bar. That's the only joke I have today. It went south very quickly, and I appreciate all of you for just feeling sorry for me. I, I just love that. It's a good video. That actually happened. Horse walked into a bar. And I, and I look at this verse. <laughs> I look at this verse because it looks like a bar joke, you know, like, what are they doing in here? But you're going to see some pretty incredible things. Again, what the church looks like and what the church is to accomplish. <coughs> One of the things that the church looks like that we get a glimpse of, a pretty radical glimpse of, is that the church overcomes people's differences. Amen. The church overcomes people's differences. Let me just pick two of them, if I can. Barnabas and Saul, all right? Barnabas and Saul. You remember a little bit back, just a few chapters ago, Saul, the guy who approved the killing of Stephen, the apostle. And so he's, he's not just killing. He's not just signing off or approving, yeah, go kill Stephen. This was a mob-like assault on Stephen, possibly roped up, and then with stones beat to death. Now, I don't know if you've ever been hit by a pebble, but it hurts. But to be beat to death by some stones is not a good way that I fantasize about going out and departing from this world. And so here's a guy that approved not just Stephen's death, but he's also approving a, a whole onslaught of believers because his job prior to Christ's conversion converting him was to destroy and stop the church here is Saul in this leadership room we'll call it because that sounds really appealing to us today here in this church meeting here's a guy who had just got through in his previous life pre-Christ killing folk and they weren't just any folk it was Christian people. In fact, I would say that this may be conjecture, but I'm just going to put, put, lay this out there, that if Barnabas is there, surely, you got to think, because this is crazy, surely Barnabas knew some of these jokers that had been afflicted on the count of Saul. Amen. And this is what you find that the church did in its infancy stage that despite their varying backgrounds and differences, the church saw reconciliation between the two differences. Here's a man who used to destroy the church, and here's a man who is spending his life building the church, and suddenly they're sitting across the aisle from each other talking about the church and the movement of the Holy Spirit. This is really interesting because I want to point this out. How some of us can't get past minor differences. And the Church of America will split in five different ways if someone just moves a piano four inches away from its intended spot. 
I've been a part of that church. You moved the hand washing thing. You are never to touch that again. It, this true story that was said to me before, and and I and I don't understand how small differences can keep us from being a part of the church. Some of you grew up Baptist. Some of you grew up Methodist. Some of you grew up Pentecostal. Some of us perhaps could be Reformed in our theology or Arminian in our theology. And if you don't know what those two things means, you're doing pretty good, okay? And, and, and some of you may be differ, differentiate among a few secondary issues. And the tragedy is, is that if we start talking about some secondary issues, some of us would just leave. I can't be a part of that church. Do that right there. That's just crazy. They believe in sign gifts. I ain't going to be a part of that. Next thing you know, they're going to be handing out snakes. (laughs) Now, here's what I'm saying in this. The thing that binds us together is the gospel of Christ. And that's all of our, that's the commonality that we have, that every single one of you you were a sinner, like you were doomed for destruction until Christ came in and rescued you. That's our common denominator. Christ is risen, and he ushered in the Holy Spirit. God is God. Jesus is, like these are the things that we hold together in common. But the reality is, is that so many of us will have a differing view or a difference in, in something or another. And that divides us. You're not sitting across the aisle from someone who used to kill your brothers and sisters. And this is what the church does. And this is what the church looks like. A church crosses beyond our differences. Not only do they cross beyond their differences, but they look past our past. They look beyond our past. And I I could use Saul. I could use all of them because they all have a past. But what about my boy, Handy Manny, here? Manan was a friend. Look at what the text. He was a friend of Herod of Tetrarch. Now, this guy is Herod Antipas. If you remember the Herod, these Herods got, ain't none of them good, right? You call him Herod the Great, it wasn't because he was awesome. He belonged on the cover of GQ. He was a terrifying individual. And Herod Antipas, if you remember how my boy John the Baptist died. I say he's my boy, never met him in my life. Remember how John the Baptist died? Very creepy story that belongs, and I don't know if this stuff is still on TV. You shouldn't be watching it, but Jerry Springer? This is a very Jerry Springer-esque type scene. Here is the party going south. They're drinking, and they are drinking it up. Herod is getting toasted, man, and so he calls out his daughter's or his wife's daughter now she ain't she ain't no saint either all right she promiscuous girl like they sing about you know and this is her she comes out there with her little seductive dancing and the bible says something very creepy herod was aroused listen to this by his wife's daughter And he looks at her and says, what you want, girl? That's my translation. And she said, she's wicked. Now, don't you look at Herod and say, you're just the most vile, disgusting person I've ever met in your life. This girl's wicked. Because she looks at him and says, give me the head of John the Baptist. Now, let me pause for a second, and let's talk about your past. Let me tell you something. You all have come in here, and you have sinned, and it is disgusting. But let me tell you some hope. You ain't that good. Now, I ain't here telling you there's a hierarchy of sin. But let's be straight. Now, unless you asking for your neighbor's head on the silver platter, we got some past issues right here. Okay? And Manny, what does the Bible say? Was a friend of Herod. And Manny is sitting here in this church meeting. You know why? Because the church can see beyond your past. And we 
we fail as a church if all we do is look at our past, all right, individually, and look at the past of others. This is what the church does. Not only that, but I want to hound on this because I, I, I try to hound on it a lot. But the church also, this is a beautiful thing, it moves beyond bigotry and racism. Now, back to the bar joke. You got, <laughs> that was pretty lame though, I'll admit. You got a guy from Niger, he's a black guy. You have a Hebraic Jew, you have a Jew, and you have several different nationalities here. And they are sitting in a room together talking about the flourishment of the church. Now, somewhere along the way, we got it wrong. All right? Now, we can start blaming and we can start talking about it. Uh, we can start talking about all these types of racism. But I'm just going to lovingly press us on this. And you may not agree with it. That's okay. I don't think we've moved as far when it comes to racism as we think we have. And here's how I know this. Because if you were to really look around this room, most, not all, but primarily, we have a lot of Anglo folks in here. And white folks. And... <laughs> And let me just tell you, that is not a picture of the church. And if I were to step into a lot of other churches, you'll just find 100% same race. All right? And I'm not hating just on white folks. I'm hating on all of us. I'm an equal opportunity offender if you didn't know that about me. I wouldn't offend everybody while I'm here. <laughs> it's not a good thing to do, I guess. Not a good – anyway. So, so here we have – Churches of America today, 2000, whatever year it is, what is it, 2018, 2018, still a segregated, and the fastest growing churches of America, get this, and this is an incredible statistic for you, the fastest growing churches of America are diverse, the dying churches of America are not diverse. We got a little bit of work to do. Because even if you look at just the demographics of not just Valley and Lynette, but if you just narrow down to West Point, there are far greater, more African-American people than there are white. And if we want our church to reflect our community, we got a little work to do because the church doesn't look like a bunch of American middle class white folk. That's not the church. That may be the church you grew up in. That is not what heaven looks like. And if you expect heaven to look like a bunch of white men with their gray hair, all with chiseled down bodies, then my friend, you have a bad concept of what heaven is. And if that's what you want heaven to look like, then baby, you ain't going. Because deep down inside of you, there is racism. And if we are more concerned about building a church that's white, and I know this is tough to swallow, but if you've been around, this isn't anything new I've said. I mean, I say this stuff all the time. I am not interested in being a white church. Now, I know I'm white. I'm, a, I'm pretty white. Yeah, I know. Thank God. Um, and I'm, I'm not just white, but I'm like white, white, like Sun scorches my skin, got a red tan, five days later, back to white. Oh. <laughs> now, in history, that was a sign of royalty. <laughs> but that ain't working out at all for me. <laughs> Here's what I'll never have to worry about, my son going to a convenience store and getting stereotyped by anybody. Because he is a white American boy beautiful blue eyes going to be tall tallest guy he's, I'm going to be looking up to him physically <laughs> and in just a matter of a couple years and let me tell you something I'll never have to worry about him getting stereotyped neither my daughter red hair beautiful you know
know? Red hair, like that, that's like a superhero gene. That's what scientists say. I have a pastor friend, and I got to get off this. I have a pastor friend that used to be here in West Point, and she moved. I was so sad when they moved because I loved them dearly. And um, a couple a couple of months ago, her son was just walking into a convenience store, and he and he w- he was he was questioned, and just because perhaps it w- because of his skin color. And I know these this family this is an incredible family. We got a little work to do, church, okay? Because what the church looks like is I'm going to press on it just a little bit. It doesn't look like what we have right now. Now, here's the other thing. The church moves beyond differences. It moves beyond our past, and it is the answer for racism and bigotry in our hearts. Now, because here's how I know this. I, I, I am not comfortable with being identified as a white dude than a Christian. Because if my identity is in my whiteness, I mean, it's pretty secure because I'm the whitest guy I know. But anyway, but if my identity is in those things, then I've kind of missed my identity, my true identity. I'm not Matthew husband, Matthew father, Matthew friend, Matthew pastor. My identity cannot be wrapped around those things. My identity, however, has to be that I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God. That my citizenship belongs to an everlasting kingdom that knows no end. And to a king that rules to where all other lower G gods and lower K kings bow to where governments tremble and bow to, where God sets the government up in the first place. That's where my king, my citizenship is. It is not in a Republican conservative whiteness. Neither is it a Democrat. Neither is it anything. My citizenship is, has to be first and foremost that I belong to the family of God, the church. That is my eternal family. You are my eternal family. And I belong to you as a kingdom citizen. Now, please, let's celebrate diversity because God does. Let's celebrate culture because it is an incredible thing. But understand that we belong first to Christ and he is our identity. And our identity is in him. Now, here's it. So this is what the church looks like. It's a beautiful thing. You got these guys. They're in this meeting. It's wonderful. (laughs) But then you're going to find out within just these three little verses what the church is is to accomplish. The Holy Spirit comes in as they're praying and fasting. And he says to them, I need you to set apart Barnabas and Saul. And y'all get out and get to work. I love that. That's incredible. This is what the church accomplishes. This is them furthering the mission of Jesus that we read about in Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 1. Go and make disciples. Go make disciples. Now, we have a pretty mission statement here. It's written under the wall. It's written in your R guide. It's on our website. It's on a lot of stuff that we have. We have a vision, mission, and we have goals. And those are great things. But I've got just a little thing that I've been dealing with in my own walk with the Lord. This is what God has been dealing with me about personally. That you've heard Proverbs um, 27, 18 or 19, where it says, and this is the KJV, <laughs> KJV, King James Version, all right? It says that where there is no vision, the people perish. Right? And we've all heard that. Yeah. Can we all? I've even gave, given some incredible sermons on that uh, <laughs> passage. And, and I never read out the KJV, but I like the KJV version because it kind of fits where I'm trying to take it. The problem is, is that's not what it's talking about. If you look at a better translation of it, it just says people without revelation, they run, a while, run around wild. In other words, here's what he's saying here. 
that if you don't have the guidance of God, then it leads to death. That verse was never intended for churches to formulate sexy, cool mission statements. Right? And I've even preached sermons about, here's our mission, y'all. Here's our goal, y'all. Here's a strategy. Here's um, here's our, our mission and vision. And that's all cool and that's all great. And we'll rally around it for like 25 minutes. And uh, because that's how far my, uh, um, yeah, okay, that's how far my sermons last. And, and we'll be like, man, that's such a good sermon. And we write it on the wall, and it's really cool. It's really cool. My, my problem with, and what I've just kind of been thinking about a lot lately, is that have we got to the point in our Christian walk that we had to formulate some cool, sexy mission statement to tell us what we're supposed to be doing. Because the problem is, Jesus didn't complicate it. These, these, these people in this, this room here, they were pretty clear on it. And notice that they didn't have to be like, all right, Paul, Saul, whatever we're calling you now. All right, Barnabas, y'all got a good, cool little mission statement we could write on a little pamphlet? Can we, yeah, can we, can we get something that rhymes? That'd be really cool. Something catchy. Something that'll appeal to the millennials. Something that'll appeal even to the old people. Can we appeal to them all? Can we just be a little relevant and cool? And this is what the church has done. But the church has not needed our sexy, cool mission statement for the past 2,000 years. In fact, this is just something new that the church has just started doing since the 80s. In fact, it's so crazy because if we didn't have a mission statement or some kind of vision statement, many people would be like, well, well, y'all, y'all just don't know what you're going to do. And I've even said those things. If we don't have a mission, then how's the church going to know what they're supposed to be doing? How do we know what we're supposed to be doing if we don't have a really cool mission statement? How is that going to know? There's no way to reach people. Amen. As if Reaching people is hanging in the balance of a cool mission statement. And I'm not rebuking you. I'm rebuking myself. Because I've thought for the past eight years that if we just had this really cool, clarifying mission statement, that we'll grow beyond measure. We're not in a crisis of ideas. We're not in a crisis of mission statements and cool and relevance. We're not in a crisis of those things. We're in a crisis of making disciples. That's your job. And if you are walking around wondering, well, I don't know what my purpose is in this church, open up your doggone Bible. Because it's pretty clear that you, as a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, your job is to make disciples that does not follow me. Because I equip the people. And I'm going to make some disciples in the process. But our job, your job, our mission. So it's just unnerving to me that many of us, we have to spend so much time in trying to identify who we are. It's madness. And I'm only coming to you with all the love and respect that I can give because this is how God has been rebuking me. I've relied on my own works to build a church. I have made an idol out of cool mission statements and all these things. And here in this passage, we get this idea, God don't need your mission statement. He doesn't need your relevance because the gospel is enough. It is both offensive and it is a, at the same time the most freeing thing Amen. that we'll ever hear. Yeah. And so here has here is the church, all right? I'm done rebuking myself. I just had to give myself a little spanking. <laughs> Hi. And I ain't talking about you, I'm talking to me. That was weird, wasn't it? Yeah, you might have a spank. <laughs> 
kind of creepy too, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm that guy. Okay. Here, here, here's what the church looks like, and here's what it accomplished. And what they accomplished was Spirit of God going into this room and telling them, uh oh, boys, two of y'all got to go. And it wasn't like a separation that was like, oh, we're cutting you off. The church of Antioch will have nothing to do with you, Barnabas and Saul. Because you know that's what the church does most of the time when people leave. It was more of a commissioning. Here's what they had. That the gospel spread and the gospel erupted because people understood that they had to be sent. They had to be sent. Now, I want to lay this out there before you guys because, again, this is just, like I said, this is just stuff I've been processing and thinking through. A, a couple of years ago, like, we were like, hey, we got a cool mission. we got a cool vision. We're going to reach 1,000 people, 1K 2020 now. Um, a couple months ago, uh, my good friend Michael Wise, you guys remember Michael, he came up here, he said, gave his testimony, and then at the end he just said, I feel like the Lord wanted me to share this, that what if 1K 2020 wasn't about how many people you sat in seats, but what if it was about how many people you're sending out? And that has not haunted me, but it has really enlightened me, that what if our job in the midst of our diversity, in the midst of this really scary time for them, it's a critical moment for them. What if that's our job? Make disciples and send them out. Now that's that's both um, terrifying, because I love every, I love most of y'all. I'm just kidding. I love all y'all. <laughs> I do. I love y'all. I do. Like I. I mean, I don't come up here just because I think it's cool. I come up here because I love you. And I would not want any of you to go. But here's the danger of the church of America. We get this ownership thing like we own each other. Like the church owns the pastor. No, you don't. And then I own you. No, I don't. You don't own me. No, I don't. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Man, hallelujah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know I love you, brother. <laughs> Sit down. But think about that, because because this is this is contrary to if you grew up in church what you what you've been taught. Because the healthy church, the church that I'm reading about here in Antioch, the healthy church was one that they had to send out. Because the gospel, the church, exploded because of their obedience to when the Holy Spirit said go, they went. And that's, that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Go. Make disciples go make disciples if you're here this morning Christ has redeemed you you have been saved by his grace your purpose is to go and make disciples I just need to say that one more time very slowly so that we are all on the same page your purpose in your life is to go and make disciples. Amen. Isn't that, I mean, it's like a deep revelation. You can go take back all them books that you that you uh, that you bought. What's my purpose? Like, take all them Joel Osteen books back because they ain't got the answer. <laughs> Our viewership probably online just went. <laughs> but I'm dead serious. Put them down. Put them down. Put them down. Because if you can't open up your Bible and see that it's very clear to you that
that your entire purpose on this planet and in your life is to make disciples, then you have missed something. Here's what I refuse to do. I refuse to, however, the, however long the Lord has me here, I refuse to be a part of a church that cannot get this go and make disciples. He didn't say come and watch and sit. Be a spectator of an incredible light show and wonderful music and a goofy guy up there yelling at us most of the time. Now, that will happen. But that's not why we're here. And I'm, I'm like bleeding on you. I realize that. I realize this is not normal for me, but I, I just want you to hear my heart. We have to do, we have to do this. And the voice of God is asking us, who's going to go? Reminds me of Isaiah 6, pretty crazy chapter. Isaiah, the year that Uzziah died, Isaiah said that I saw the Lord lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And there were these little angels, and they began to call out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah has an incredible response, as we all should, that when you see the glory of God, it reveals how dirty and unclean you are. And he says, I am just an unclean dude here. Because that's what the glory and the presence of the Lord does. Not only, he threw his whole nation under the bus, too. He's like, I'm unclean. All these other jokers, they dirty, too. <laughs> I mean, you think about it, that's pretty spectacular, that the presence of God can reveal not just your issues, but it reveals everybody's issues. That did not stop what happens next. They come down. They touch his lips. And God asks, who's going to go? Now, in my mind, Isaiah is probably the only joker in there. You know, he's probably looking around like waiting for somebody to say, uh, I will, but that doesn't happen. Yeah. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Now, the rest of the chapter is pretty terrifying. He says, all right, cool. And I bet you Isaiah is like fired up. Now we're going to go. We're going to go and win the nations. We're going to go and do incredible stuff. But God said, wait a second. The, everything you say, they won't understand. Everything they see, they'll have no clarity about. So what if God is calling us to that? Are you still willing? What if God has called us to a community with deaf ears? Are you still willing to be faithful that despite how many people ever walk in this room, that in the end, you say, God, I was faithful to everything you told me to do? Is that our story? Despite the fact no one would listen, God, I did what you told me to do. I don't want to be found successful. That's so stupid. I want my last day when I meet Christ face to face, him to find me faithful. It's my guy who is making disciples right here.